church god's family god's healthy family adopting and befriending the world immediately you'll realize adopting is a legal term befriend befriending is a social term some of us are legalistic some of us are socialistic and many of us are capitalistic of course but so we have to get this thing right about uh, the legal part of god adopting us and the social part of how we relate to him and our family and to the world so church as healthy family what is the church benefits of belonging to a church the attitudes that would maximize its benefits to you the culture of honor appreciation only good gossip so you must gossip the gospel how many of you know there's good gossip it rain cats dogs dinosaurs Uh, raptosaurus and all in the up country yesterday shall we give a hand clap to jesus yes we want rain isn't it uh, for tea cultivation for our drinking water for our hydric electricity generation so you are given permission fully to do good good gossip which means gossip the gospel gossip good stories yes no gossip so uh, the first script i like to introduce you to you to is Romans 8:15 the adoption the birth and the legal part for you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again so fear began in the garden of eden because the first recorded word of adam to eve was i am afraid you remember that i am afraid so fear is a real thing fear is our fight to protect ourselves shall be said together fear is our fight to protect ourselves so when christ comes into us the change that happens is we experience that he can fight better than ourselves and that he protects us now sometimes if a wife is all the time dishonored by the husband she has to fight for her rights that would not be marriage similarly if the wife dishonors her head who is the husband he will also fight for his rights either silently or vociferously how many of you know that you can fight ferociously verbally loudly or you can fight silently secretly but effectively now take 30 seconds to identify what kind of a fighter you are <laughs> aggressive pugilistic belligerent next door also gets to know there's a fight but there are others who are resistant fighters silent you you can't erode them but thank god christ in us he has given to us not a spirit of fear 2 timothy 1:7 shall we say that together he has not given to us a spirit of fear but of power and of love and a sound mind where did the sound mind come from we are much loved and empowered so the unsoundness of mind and the fear of mind comes from two sources i am powerless to change the situation i am unloved those two things constantly speak in us being unloved being powerless isn't it yes so romans 8:15 you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons and daughters by which we cry out abba father so we are born again to belong again i often say begotten to beget others into the family of christ so that's very biological language uh, trust god and accept family members and so family members become friends now turn to your family member and say hmm, you are my family member no what to do do you say things like that no family members become friends isn't it did i sort of upset some deep truth 
I sort of got the feeling that I have sort of touched a sore point. Family members have friends. Uh, so in church family also, this is what we are to become. So we accept them and I change to fit them into family. A young woman who is all conscious of her figure completely changes within about three to four months of pregnancy. You, you get the idea you are carrying another life and all your life is completely missed because you are carrying a, another life. Now, some of you would say, from the first day I went out with him dating, my life was anyway messed. No, th that's not true. Dating is an experience where you get to know each other. I did a full study on this, clarifying that he is the life partner, she is the life partner. Dating is not for intimacy. Intimacy is for marriage. Dating is for clarifying. Uh, so, the, the, I understand that there's a secular context for dating. I'm defining the Christian context for dating. Clarifying, is he, is she, my life partner from the Lord, isn't it? So if we have not found our destiny in Christ, then to find our destiny in marriage would be a hard struggle. God's natural grace is there, but to begin marriage, knowing God as our father, becomes very easy. Being in God's family, doing your family, is very easy. That's how God meant it to be. Uh, so accept them and I change to fit them into the family. So I will constantly move between natural family, biological family and church family because the two go parallel. So I change to accept them. So when the daughter is arriving, in our case we have only one, when daughter was arriving, I began to change completely. Before that, I ate most of the proteins in the house. Uh, I was only a medical officer, you know, and medical officer's salaries were not great. So whatever protein that came, somehow I managed to take most of it. Moment my wife got pregnant, obviously I couldn't eat the proteins. She had to get the proteins and with a salary of 1,600 rupees in 1977, <laughs> proteins were not easy to buy even then. That, that was our salary. Uh, so thank God we changed to fit Take the fit that comes in. Hebrews 2, 9 to 11. We do see him who was made for a little lower than the angels. So when we think of church family, we look to Jesus. To create family of God, he became lower than what he was. So in church fellowship all the time, you are called to be less than what you are. Which is a sacrifice. Because our model is Jesus. We don't come to church to advance ourselves. Advance will come, but Jesus made himself lower than the angels. So when we gave up our professions and went to the village for gospel work, we had nobody to speak in English. We had a couple and his name was Timothy, her name was Silly. Uh, those days there was a name called Silly. I don't think you have that name anymore. He was a hefty man and that was one of the first couples we got. I went visiting him and they lived in a shack covered with plastic. They were so poor. So uh, we do see him who made, was made a little lower than the angels, namely Jesus. So he, Philippians 2 says, he who was God, equal to God, thought not to grasp that equality, but he became lower, lower, made in human form, then he became a slave, a bond slave, and he humbled himself to the death of the cross. This is how Jesus made family. And this is how we make family, which is Jesus' family. You, you understand that? Yeah. This is the intentional process we agree to in the family of Christ. Because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting for him for whom are all things. Uh, so, verse 10, for it was fitting for him. So we always say, if it was fitting for Jesus, it fits me. Shall we say together, if it was fitting for Jesus, it fits me. So if the call comes to go lower, as you, as you uh, live your Christian life in a large family, all we have to say is, it was fitting for Jesus it's okay for me. It was fitting for Jesus, it's okay for me. Now we all suffer with power cuts, 
gas, kerosene, all kinds of shortages. I thought the church in China suffers all the time like that. Agreed? First century church suffered just like that. But we have got used to a lot of creature comforts. That's how the world develops. But when creature discomforts come, what will speak more, your Christianity or the discomfort? That's where the rubber hits the road. So we have to consciously say to ourselves, my Christianity will speak more than the creature discomforts. Shall we say that together? My Christianity will speak more wrath altogether. My Christianity will speak louder than the creature discomforts. We all feel the creature discomforts. But we make a conscious decision, no, it was fitting for Jesus, it fits me okay. Shall we say that together? It was fitting for Jesus, it fits me okay. I'm not saying this is right what the government is doing. I'm only saying as Christians, our Christianity speaks louder than the, the discomfort, creature discomfort, yes. And through whom are all things in bringing many sons and daughters to glory to perfect the author of their salvation through suffering. Hebrews 2, 11 to 12. So the first, that, that scripture identifies the one father, many sons, one family. Shall we say together, one father, the son, many sons, one family. Next scripture identifies the elder brother, many brothers and sisters, the ecclesia. Will you say with me, the ecclesia. For both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all from one father. The, the meaning of sanctified, the Greek is hegia, is belonging to God in the family. Shall we say together, belonging to God in the family. Now we belong to God in our talents, in our time, in our treasures, in everything we have. We belong to him more than to ourselves. That's the deal. In all we do, in all we think, we belong to him more than to ourselves. That's a big leap. That's the cross. That's what sanctified means. My talent, my... This is why we are in a family to help each other to live through this. Because our first response is, ah! that was unjust. If Jesus said that in his lifetime, Every day, 100 times, he would have nothing else to speak but unjust, unjust. They are questioning his wisdom. They are, he's omniscient. They are questioning his theology. They are questioning his character. They are questioning his motives. They are calling him a rebel, the perfect one. So when these things come our way, we say, I have given my right to judgment, my right to exact, my right to vengeance, my right to backbite, my right to poison pen, letters, what else? All that we have given to him, that's what sanctification is. All our hours, our time, talent, we have given to him. And with his glory in mind, and with his help, we live our earthly life, and our, and our job, and everything else, as coming from him, as belonging to him, that is what sanctification is. So we, before, we, before we get into anything, before we get into any spending, we ask him, is this, is, are you allowing me to spend for this? Are you allowing me to spend for this my time, my talent, my treasure? And so we keep checking up with him, for whom are all things. So this is the ecclesia. He who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all from one father, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. So that strong identity when we have Jesus living in us, his life, John 15, John 10, 15, he said, I lay down my life, but I take it up again in those who give their life for me to live my life in them. That's the Christian's call. Jesus is asking for my life to live his life in me. Is it a, worthy, is it a gamble worth? Can't you live your life better without Christ interfering with it. Now we thought so for some time. We thought, my father thought so for 57 years of his life. 
Hiranthi's father thought so for 50 years of his life. Thankfully, I thought so for 17 and a half years of my life. 17 and a half years, I said, okay, Lord Jesus, I think, I'm convinced that you living your life in me would give me the best results for my life. Understood? That's the call. Shall we repeat that and see? Lord Jesus, you living your life in me will give me the best dividends in my life. I'm convinced. No more doubting. That's how we settled on it. That is what is called sanctified. In all we do, we belong to him. My present belongs to him and my past Lock, stock and barrel, good, the bad, the ugly. When you say GBU, be careful, the person may, you know, WhatsApp language, when you say GBU, the person may interpret it as good, bad and ugly. But we mean God bless you. Uh, so the, all what has happened in our past, he owns. All what's happening in our present, he owns. So his, our future also and our children's future, he owns. So what he owns, he manages the way as if it belongs to him. But if we have a desire to own what we have, as we own and we manage, Jesus has no competition. So I, I, I think I told this on the Bible study or somewhere. I said, leading is very easy in the church. I have led church from 1981. Of course, we were in a hut. I had only my wife, my little daughter, and our foster daughter to lead. Then came Timothy and Silly and a few others. So leading was very easy because you lead only what people allow you to lead. You're a fool, try to lead what people have not given you to lead, correct? It's very easy. This is leadership in the church. You lead what they have given to Christ to lead, yes. Uh, so, this is sanctification, and he's our older brother. Uh, for both he who sanctifies and who are sanctified all from one father, for which reason he's not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brethren in the midst of the ecclesia. I will sing your praise. So, this ecclesia is a legal term used at that time. It was a governmental body with governmental authority. So church is family. It also has the authority of God to do what we have to do. Now I have called forth a little group called Men of Magnificence because they were feeling left out because there was a ladies called Women of Worth. How many of you are in Women of Worth? Samantha, you are there, isn't it? Women of Worth, yes. If you have not joined it, please contact. Whom should they contact? Samantha. Before uh, you go, that's Samantha. She's trying to hide as much as possible. Uh, she's there. there. There she's dressed. There. Yeah. Please contact Samantha uh, uh, so that you may know the Women of Worth program. So I came up with the name Men of Magnificence. Only thing the acronym for Men of Magnificence is what? M O M. Uh, I couldn't help it, but you know, we all begin with them. Yeah. Uh, so please uh, get together. Priyal is very keen about it. Priyal usually comes to the evening service. Uh, Jehan, you had suggested something. That's a good suggestion. Please get together to have a men's breakfast. Yes. So Ecclesia called and brought together. Uh, then here is the befriending part from John 15, 13 to 16. Born again to belong again. That's a maxim in our church family. Born, shall we say together? Born again to belong again. So the Lord causes people to be born again, mostly in the context of a church. There may be someone like Saul, the, Paul the Apostle, who got born again on the way to Damascus from heaven. But pretty soon, God put him in touch with a chap called Ananias in the city of Damascus. God said, go, there's an impossible fellow called Paul. Saul, who has just got born again, he's blind go meet him. So God connected even this impossible soul of Tarsus, born again in the way to Damascus by a God encounter, by a God encounter, he put them, quickly God put him in touch with Ananias, who was able to handle a chap like 
Paul of uh, Saul of Tarsus, who later became Paul the Apostle. So Ananias was a man of ranking enough who could handle a bundle like Paul. That's how God does things. He was not alone. From the day of his birth, the best possible Christian in Damascus, in God's estimate, who would fit the bill, came and met together with Paul. So uh, John 15, 13 to 16, greater love has no one than this, that one lays down his life for his friends. But Jesus did that. You are my friends. If, I, if you do what I command you, no longer do I call you slaves, for the slaves, slave does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends for all things that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you. So this is how we are together, because he chose and put us together. That's how we come into one family. He chose and put us together. If we don't have that conviction, it becomes very difficult to stay in the family. He chose and put us together. Yes. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit, that your fruit would remain, so that whatever you ask, the, uh, ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. So how people come into our life, uh, Shiloma in her message last Sunday gave the three ways. God made relatives. By birth we have them. So in a sense, church has a spiritual birth that put us together. We are. I only knew my sister, I think, before. You know, I only knew my sister of the crowd here, isn't it? We, we know each other now because we came to Christ. So we make relatives, spiritual relatives by birth. Then uh, Shiloma said, we meet people in work. So church has ministry, so we are together for a work of the ministry. Three, we choose friends, and when we come to church, we realize Christ chose our friends. What to do? You got born again in this church family. So what to do? You have to become my friend, and I have to become your friend. I don't know which is easier. You work it out, which is easier. So that's how, no, it's a great joy. You know, it's a great joy. Uh, I have 2,500 Facebook friends. How many have you? I have only 2,500. 2,400 are atheists. They were my colleagues. I intentionally befriend them so that I can tell them the gospel. That's the only reason why I'm, why I'm on Facebook. I'll be a fool to say, I have, I have 2,500 friends, how many? They are acquaintances, but I have met them in the walk of life, and my responsibility to them is that they come to know Christ. Uh, so this is how church has all three aspects, relatives by spiritual birth, one family, growing friendship, work of the ministry. Jesus said, Mark 3.35, whoever does sister is my mother. So we are, but you are developing new brothers, new sisters, a new parenthood in Christ, which is also very precious, and the former is also precious. How Jesus fetched family. So how did Jesus start this? Mark 3, 13 to 15, he went up on the mountain and summoned those whom he himself wanted, and they came to him. And so when, when Peter came, Andrew came, John came, James came, uh, Judas, the, the, the Simon the Zealot came, the revolutionary, then Matthew the tax gatherer came, the imperialist, uh, the, the one who served the imperial government, and Simon the Zealot came, one who, uh, one who was against the imperial government in revolution. I think he first came with a dagger in, under his belt to stab this fellow to death as a soon as possible opportunity, but they all changed because of Christ. So they were put together because Christ called them. That's what has happened to us. We, have, we are learning family. We learn family because Christ put us together. He appointed 12 so that they would be with him. So first part of church is we are with each other. That's the first part of church family. And then out of that union and communion, he could send them out. That is apostoluo. The Greek is apostoluo. Send them out to preach, to have authority to cast out demons, being and belonging and then working. Let's say together. Being, belonging, then working. Don't put the cart before the horse. If we don't get being in Christ first, belonging in Christ first, 
we have to get those two first, otherwise we will be a secular institution doing work. Even marriage can become a secular institution doing work. You go on this way, you go on this way, I have three daughters to raise up, send them, graduate them, marry them, find them diabetes, do they still do that? Even marriage can become an institution that works for a purpose with no intimacy. That's not how church is or that's not how marriage is, isn't it? We, we, are, we, we have our being in Christ, we belong in Christ, and then we have a work of the ministry coming out of it. So he, having been with each other, he could send them out to preach, have authority to cast out demons, being and belonging, and then working. So church and family analogy, leadership, so leadership is like parents in the house. Husband and wife become parents. Your marriage affects what kind of parents you are. So will your marriage influence your leadership. So we took a decision long ago that we will never discuss church problems in the presence of our daughter in her growing years. But she saw space for your husband intentionally. Because we can get to the point we can do without them, we think. God didn't mean it like that. God didn't mean it like that. Please find time and space for each other. Otherwise, the heart of God will be sad. God will say, I weep for you. Make a conscious effort to make time for each other. Life, you will say, yes, uh, we both sleep together uh, so that from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m., we are with each other, of course, very good children, no fighting, sleeping and snoring other than for snoring fights. Now, it's not sleep time. I'm saying day time, make space and time for each other. In marriage, we grow in leadership, providing each other time and space. Ephesians 5.22. Wives, uh, I think I'll, I'll, I'll skip those scriptures and I'll come to Honor and appreciation, slide number 12. Father gives honor, mother gives appreciation. That's how home runs. Father must also learn to give appreciation, but father gives honor. The amount of time he takes in the home, amount of discussion time he has with uh, wife and children, father gives honor. Honor is a God thing. He comes from, it comes from above. Appreciation is also a God thing, but it's more a relational thing also. So please find at least once a day to say thank you, that was very kind of you, that are very good of you. Please say it to each other. If you were to have countless tutors in Christ, yet you would not have many fathers. For in Christ I became your father through the gospel. That's a real relationship. Paul is speaking to whom he had begotten. In Christ, I became your father through the gospel. For in Christ, I became your father through the gospel. I still remember the first day you came and I met you and prayed with you. I remember each of you where I first met you and prayed with you for your salvation. That's the father's prerogative in the gospel. And I do my best to carry it through life. And I have similarly... 24 sons and daughters all over scattered in the island. They are full-time pastors, Tamil and Sinhala. I do my best to keep my heart of affection. And I am saying this, you are called similarly, to keep a heart of affection. Across the Tamil congregations, they know that Lalit Mendes is a person who deeply cared for the Tamil community. Thank God they are coming back to reconstruct Sri Lanka. Thank God they are coming back to reconstruct Sri Lanka. You know the truth? Tamil people all over the world scattered. They still pine for Sri Lanka. Singhala people all over the world scattered. I stopped there. I met them widely in a many, many nations, many, many continents. They pine for Sri Lanka. They want to come back and do something. But they are only asking, please heal our hurt. Hurting people can't build. Hurting people hurt. What do hurting people do? they hurt. And having hurt, they hurt others. Now it's a gracious chance, a glorious chance. And we have a Christian governor who can help in this greatly. You have to get into this. Thank God the hour has come. We are praying that this will go through and Sri Lanka will be healed, healed, healed 
of all her deep wounds thank you father so father gives honor mother gives appreciation and paul says my children with whom i am again in labor until christ is formed in you what works for family works for church here are six characteristics i want to get into honoring it all begins with honoring god and honoring one another honor is a still present reverential presence in the house depicted by that little board many christian homes have christ is the silent listener to every conversation he is the chief guest of every meal mom and dad get to the dinner table lunch table or breakfast table every day at the same time get your children around it that's a biblical command psalm 128 that you will be like little olive shoots around one table that house is blessed every meal as much as possible all together no digital screen give me a wave on it all together no digital screen i want to wave on it yeah mom and dad children together do it together please this is how god's honor settles in that home like an invisible glow absolutely so that's the honor of god settling beginning with the dining table meal table also we know hebrews 13:7 say hebrews 13:8 says hebrews 13:6 says marriage bed is honorable undefiled two places where god's honor comes so here are things honor and submission submission is easy if honor is there submission is easy if honor is there i would never sit with my legs cocked up in front of my father not even after i graduated because it was honor isn't it submission is easy that's a physical thing but that's how it was submission is easy if when honor is there so you can't demand submission but when honor is there you you know you go low before honor you are safe when you are submitting to honor you are safe so i pray every young lady here will have a husband to submit to whom it's a pleasure it's your protection to submit to your kinsman redeemer is your protection he carries your honor he guards your honor with his mouth and with his life and with his sexual integrity when you are not there and when you are there shall you say bless the lord bless the lord bless the lord all my life i have guarded my eyes so that i will not dishonor my wife do you understand that's how it is all my life i have not permitted any female to have any conversation any suggestion that will dishonor my wife that's the honor to which a wife submits vice versa that's the honor that guards her health and guards your health of course yes please agree to these things then comes another set contribution and growth this is a long study but i want to touch some of them before i so in church we are together for contribution which is valued your contribution is valued in contributing you grow we do not contribute for exhibition so when uh, shilomo was leading and others were so well supporting were they exhibiting they were contributing a vital lead in worship sunday morning in the house of god in it you grow and there's a cost you know that you have to come one hour early correct one hour early there's a cost to it you grow and we grow so in, in church this both angles are facilitated what honor and submission contribution and growth we grow together by contributing that's why we contribute and sometimes contribution is very sacrificial isn't it i begin my sunday message preparation on this sunday night this sunday night but when you do a medical lecture you prepare it for once and that's it you add up the things little by little if there are any updates but every sunday when it's over i'm already beginning for the next sunday because that that's the honor to eat because you are sure of it some people like to try out a new eating place every day yeah so what are you stable or very stable 
ovarius. So in our dating, we begin to know each other and have the change before marriage. Honor each other's preferences or have prejudices. So you have to help each other in this. So stability and variety. Church is a place, there's a lot of variety. You get to meet different people. You may meet introverts, you meet extroverts. You live to live with them together. Now, 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says, for by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, we were all made to drink of one spirit. Our change comes because we are drinking of the one Holy Spirit. We are changing from inside. Not that we are changing from outside, but we are conscious that we are Everything God designed church is for is to people to change together. If you come to church saying, I'm going to change. I'm not going to speak to anyone. Uh, masks are helpful for that also. That is not church. That is not church. God designed church that every part will affect the other part. So iron sharpens us to help us change. So this is about stability and variety. Uh, then we have connection and significance. Connection is about dissolving with people. Significance is about how they see your influence. So they look as if at contrary ends. And you can become like that. I am looking how much I am able. But Jesus put connections and significance to come out of connection. Am I making myself clear? If you get connected with people on the basis of serving them, you will find your niche of importance, influence, significance. Our heart craves for it. To hear that we were useful. Agreed? We were useful. Yes. And most of you missed last Saturday Bible study. You missed, 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 yes. Uh, so you missed a lot, really. I did a study on the shout on Calvary with which Jesus exited earth. It was a shout of victory. And who picked up that shout of victory? The centurion who crucified him. Battle-scarred veteran. He heard this. He saw the process. And when the Lord cried out, and it is finished, he said, that's not the shout or the cry of a desperate, devastated, defeated victim. He said, that sounds the shout of a conqueror who achieved what he came to achieve. We know cross was terrible, but on it he achieved what he came to achieve. Who picked it up first? Not the disciples. The battle scarred centurion. And Lloyd C. Douglas wrote a novel or a historic novel called The Robe based on that centurion story that is fictional but Bible says Mark 15 38 centurion said surely this was the son of God he believed hearing the shout of Christ on the cross now he comes again with a similar shout which is a battle cry 1 Thessalonians 4 16 with the trump of God with the voice of the archangels and the church is between one shout and the next shout. That was the picture of the Bible study. Since you have done the error of not participating in it, do the rectification of listening to the clip. Okay? Give me a wave on it. Please listen to it. It's important that we be live with ready to win that battle. That's the preparation of the bride for his coming. That's the preparation of the church for his coming. Yes. Uh, Connection and significance. So we dissolve in connections and in our dissolving into the lives of others, we find significance. This is how it is. Salt dissolves. Light flashes. So flashes also come. Most of Christian life would be dissolving and adding your flavor. If you stay to yourself, you can't add flavor. But flashes of light will also be there. 
Then the last point I want to make is sufficiency and sacrifice. Jesus doesn't ask for sacrifice from discontented people. Now often when something bad happens, I you this is my cross. To some people, mother-in-law is the cross. To some people, the workplace is the cross. To some people, husband is the cross. What to do this fellow? Every day I have to teach him. I don't know, he don't know, he does not know any table manners. And if he takes a fork and spoon, he makes such a lot of noise. And he's poking food in his, into the mouth all the time. I have told him so many times, don't put more than, don't, don't eat with your b b b cheeks bulging. Don't make sounds when you are eating. And eat in the plate. Don't, don't let the food go to the rim of the plate. You have to eat within. Any more lessons you need in culinary grace? Uh, don't spill the food and you know all that, okay? Now, when we have sufficiency, we easily sacrifice. Christ didn't take a cross that he did not like. So don't insult the cross by saying, this government is our cross. Or the power cut is my cross. Or having to work in a place like this is my cross. Don't insult the cross. Jesus Christ took the cross voluntarily, willingly. From birth to death, he lived happily. Suffered, yes, but he chose it. You understand the cross? Cross is what we give up now that we may gain him. So, City Stud said, he was a cricketer and a, and, a, and a man with estate. He gave it up all to become a missionary. He said, if Christ being God died for me, no sacrifice on my part is too great for him. Jim Elliot, a young missionary, he said, he is no fool who loses what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. So we sacrifice out of sufficiency. We are so well treated. To sacrifice is a joy. Don't do sacrifice if it is not a joy. Then it is not sacrifice. It is drudgery. It is torture. I repeat, don't call it sacrifice if it is torture. Call it torture. What we do for Christ or for a loved one must be out of sufficiency. 